Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you uh, very much for giving us your time today. What I'll be uh, talking about um, uh, over the next 35 minutes or so, I'll initially sort of go through some of the, the key macroeconomic concerns that uh, investors are facing at the moment. Um, I'll move on to some of our uh, key investment themes and individual stocks. And uh, to finish off, I'll just talk briefly about some of the changes that we've made at Platinum recently. And of course, at the end, we'll have uh, plenty of time for Q&A. Now, for any of you who've been to uh, one of our presentations over the last 20 years, there's a pretty good chance you've seen this slide uh, at some point. At the core of our investment approach is a very simple idea, and that is that from time to time, the market will place too much emphasis on what are short-term or transitory events. And so when that, those events or news is bad for an industry or a company or a country, that's where we want to focus and look for potential buys. Conversely, when the news is great, everyone knows it's a really good investment idea, these are the places that typically we think one should be avoiding. So where are we today in terms of where global equities fit uh, on this uh, cycle? Particularly given that, you know, since the middle of last year, uh, in local currency terms, local uh, global equities are up more than 20%. For the Australian investor, more than 40%. Well, we actually think there are still good opportunities for investors from global shares and probably more so uh, for the Australian investor. But before I get into that, I'd just like to take you through, um, take you back to over a year ago, May 2012, we were going around uh, doing a, a unit holders roadshow and advisor roadshow at that time. And the thing that was very clear uh, from talking to the individual investor was their focus on absolute certainty in their portfolios. It, typically, when you were talking to people after the presentation, they'd all be comparing where they were getting their best term deposit rates at the moment. Now, this need for certainty back then really was not that surprising if you think of what the world was like. We had the US economy, it was recovering, but uh, not particularly impressively, and on top of that we're all fearful of the fiscal cliff that was coming at the beginning of 2013. Europe was in the midst of its sovereign debt crisis. Italy, Spain were facing very significant increases in the cost of funding with their bond markets collapsing. And Japan was, well, Japan was Japan. Um, and what's more, the Australian dollar had been the great safe haven of global currencies, it was steadfast in its strength, which made the idea of globing, global investing even less palatable. But this desire for absolute certainty post the GFC and the various uh, volatility uh, phases of volatility we went through after that, where this led investors to was their very safe investments, even in the stock market. Um, we wanted you know, yield stocks, global uh, consumer staples, very safe businesses. And this craving for certainty meant that investors have missed out on a 40% plus return from global equities and uh, over 47% in the Platinum International Fund since that time. So when we look at this chart, a year ago, very clearly global equities were in the area of neglect and certainly the benefits of fixed interests and safe investments like cash were certainly being eulogised. But again, the question is where are we today after the big run up we've had and clearly we're not at the extremes of a year ago. But I would put it to you that there's still a huge sense of cautious, cautiousness amongst investors. I ask you, how many of your clients are coming into your office begging for you to increase their allocation to equities? I suspect it's not many. So it's not that surprising really when, when again we look at the list of concerns that are out there. And what I'd like to do is go through some of these um, macro concerns that we see on the front page of the Fin Review most days and just suggest some potential alternative scenarios to how things might unfold 
uh, relative to the normal gloom and doom that we're seeing. So if we look at the US, now this is the one global economy that's actually had a pretty good uh, recovery in the scheme of things. Housing is coming back nicely. Um, you know, auto sales are strong as you see in this chart. Uh, consumer durables are going well. So that economy is looking pretty good and it's looking so good that we're now worried about what happens when the Fed starts to end their policy of quantitative easing. Now, we think these concerns are overstated for a couple of reasons. The first of all, generally when economies are recovering and they face the first tightening of monetary policy, which we would normally see in past cycles as interest rates being increased, if the economy is robust, it doesn't knock it off its recovery path. And while there's a lot of debate about just how robust this recovery is, you should consider that it's been occurring in the face of what has been a very significant fiscal contraction. Fiscal deficit over the last 12 months in the US is down by 2% of GDP, a tightening that would normally uh, cause some uh, very significant uh, hesitation in most economies. So the recovery is a bit better than I think people are giving it credit for. But the other issue is simply the policy of quantitative easing was designed to get some inflation into the economy. And in fact, inflation on stated levels is really at 10-year lows. So I think the idea that there is going to be any significant change in policy from the Fed is, again, probably overstated. When we go to Europe, most of the commentary I'd pick up, whether it's in the papers uh, or the many emails I get every day, still effectively would describe Europe as a basket case. And yet, interestingly, things are looking a little better there. So if we look at some of the problematic economies in Europe, um, Ireland, Portugal, Spain, Italy, each of these countries are now running current account surpluses. And indeed, in the case of Ireland, that current account surplus is now 6% of GDP. Now, the significance of this is simply that these economies have shrunk to a point where they are now internally funded. They are not re reliant on capital inflows to fund their economy. It doesn't tell you that they're going to start growing, but it probably is highly indicative of the fact that they, do, they no longer need to shrink. And indeed, there are many signs that these economies are bottoming out. So if we look at a place like Ireland, uh, we have had, um, over the last year, jobs being created for the first time since the GFC. We have property prices in Dublin are now up marginally on a year ago, and generally uh, the GDP of that country is actually trending higher. If we go to Japan, another one of the great problem spots of the world, it's actually looking a bit better over the last 12 months. Um, consumer confidence is at the highest level it's been in over a decade. Uh, durable sales, are, consumer durable sales are growing nicely you have property transaction volumes picking up as well. Now, all of this has occurred really on the back of two things, the promise of a lot of reform from the Abe government and a significant devaluation of the yen. And so many, as we've seen in Japan over the last 20 years, we've had these moments before where things are looking better and many doubt the longevity of this recovery. But the key at the heart of the reforms that are promised is the idea of creating labour mobility so that companies can shed extra staff and that they can move to places where they're needed. And also key to it is reform of the financial system, which will see money flow to projects that are worthwhile rather than uh, holding up those companies that should perhaps be shrinking. And undoubtedly, if these reforms go through, it will lead to greater corporate profitability from that, investment will flow, and we suspect, indeed, economic growth will as well. Moving on to perhaps the, 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 the place that causes us the most concern, particularly as Australians, is China. The country's had a fantastic investment boom for over a decade, and clearly we are coming near the end of that great investment phase. And you know, we've been writing about this in our quarterlies 
uh, for three or four years now. Undoubtedly, there are going to be issues. We will be left with an, a, a system that will have too much capacity in a lot of industries. There'll be too much steel capacity, too much cement capacity. There will be bad debts um, building up in the banking system. But our experience of investing in China over the last 20 years has been this. When one part of the economy slows, invariably money will find, capital will find its way to the more interesting parts of that economy. And in China, that's clearly the consumer. Whether we look at auto sales, uh, the consumption of healthcare or financial products, China has a long way to go. And to give you a sense of some of the things that are happening now, e-commerce is rising very rapidly in China. So we now have estimates that it's anywhere between four to eight percent of retail sales. And with that is going now a whole round of investment uh, into the logistics systems that are needed to support uh, that very strong growth. Now, we may not be, and I should say just before moving on from China, you know, when we actually look at the economy and what's actually happening, um, yes, it is slowing down in many areas, but in, if you look at the consumer related uh, parts of the economy, re residential property sales, uh, auto sales, these areas are actually travelling uh, quite nicely, holding up and in fact in the case of autos growing uh, quite well at the moment. We may not be right about some of these economic scenarios where things turning out a little bit better than the, the typical expectation, but there are very significant fears in markets for these poor outcomes that we're hit with every day. And what I would note is this. Global equities, and this chart here of the MSCI is in local currency terms, so it doesn't have any impact of the Australian dollar, is essentially at the same level it was in 2000. So you haven't made money out of global equities for the best part of 13 years. And on, during that period, earnings for these companies are up over 50 per cent. If you put it in the Australian dollar context, it's even longer. We go back to 98. Um, we're at the same levels for Australians. The global equities hit the best part of 15 years ago. So we are optimistic that we're going to make money from stocks over the next three to five years. But I should say that all of what I've been talking about, this market analysis, the economic analysis, really is not what the primary driver of that enthusiasm, is not the primary driver of that enthusiasm. What gets us excited about the prospects are the individual opportunities that we see in industries and individual companies. So what I'd like to do is move on to discussing some of those investment themes. Now at the core of our portfolio, one of the, the, the core theme running through the, the international fund and the other funds, many of the other funds, is the internet. And in particular, the changes being driven by the rapid adoption of smartphones and tablet devices. Now, I appreciate that there was a bull market based on this premise about 15 years ago. But if you think about technologies that have changed the world, something like railways, it created multiple stock market booms through the 1800s. And with the internet, we think we will go through uh, you know, numerous periods of enthusiasm for stocks in particular areas simply because businesses are being created and destroyed every day. And that's when the great opportunities arise in equities. So think about some of the things that are happening in the internet today. And you'll be aware of all of these. So e-commerce. You know, when we started on e-commerce, it was about buying known quantities, buying books, buying running shoes, buying electronic devices. Today, this is moving very rapidly into areas such as fashion items, things that one would have expected you would never buy sight unseen. And e-commerce is then driving a whole lot of other changes, changes in payment systems, changes, changes in logistic systems as well. And from that, um, we uh, see lots of other changes occurring as well. So for example, we have 
mobile, mobile devices are, are helping um, drive the adoption of music and video streaming services, services that have been around for a while, but because they're now available to you on your smartphone, they're being adopted much more rapidly. We have the, ch the way we're using the internet, the nature of searching for things on the internet is changing. Uh, in travel, TripAdvisor is the key place to go to find out about where you should be going or staying. Um, a local one that's been very successful, obviously, is realestate.com. That's where we go to find out about where we, what properties are available for sale or when we're trying to promote our property for sale. The ability of businesses to run their IT on the cloud, we all have heard about this. Again, it's completely changing the nature of um, the IT landscape. And there are very few of us in our businesses who aren't impacted. The way we are interacting with our clients or our suppliers is very different to what it was a decade ago. Now, to just look at one of the, 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 the sort of newer changes in a little more detail, one of the things that smartphones has done is it's, it's, it's given rise to this whole range of messaging applications. And you may have come across these. Um, the big one in the developed markets is WhatsApp. Um, I don't know if those with teenagers, mine certainly use a thing called Kik, K I K, uh, to communicate with one another. And a messaging app, for those who haven't used them, it really started out as a simple way of avoiding sending an SMS uh, or text message. In, it's essentially the same thing. As long as your recipient has the application, you can send the message by your application and you're avoiding getting charged by your telco. Um, but these things have morphed into something much greater than simple SMS or simple text style messages. We're using them for photo sharing. We're using them for leaving voice messages. We're using them, WhatsApp have introduced a walkie talkie type function. Um, games are being played or downloaded on these applications and played amongst friends. Um, and they're now being used to lead into e-commerce opportunities. So something like WhatsApp has around 250 million users worldwide. Uh, WeChat, which is the popular one in China, has over 300 million users in China and 50 million users outside of China. And money is being made here. It's being made from selling you those games. It's being made from advertising. It's being made uh, or will be made uh, in the future from e-commerce opportunities. Now, all of this activity across the net is driving demand for bandwidth. Um, and we all know about this in the mobile telephone area where uh, telcos around the world are having to upgrade their systems to 4G. But it's also happening in the fixed line system where bandwidth bottlenecks are developing and there's need to upgrade um, uh, the, the network capacity for the fixed lines. Now, of course, none of what I tell you is particularly new or revealing. Um, and indeed, many of the stocks that are benefiting from some of these trends are very popular ones, well-owned, and indeed are probably more in the eulogistic phase than the area of neglect. But it's our observation there are still many interesting uh, opportunities, and I'd just like to take you quickly through a, a number of these that are in our portfolios. So to start with, Google needs no real uh, discussion. Baidu. Baidu is the Chinese uh, search engine, and um, if you want to know a bit more about that, you can read it, about it in our quarterlies. A year ago, when we were out here talking, we were talking about Sina. Uh, it is um, the, basically it owns Weibo, which is China's Twitter. Um, but we also have some newer ones. So, for example, uh, Naver. Now, Naver uh, is a Korean company, another search engine. It's the dominant search engine in Korea and in itself a nice enough business. But what Neighbor also owns is one of these messaging apps called Line, L-I-N-E. Um, now, in the space of two years, uh, they have gathered over 250 million users. They are the leading messaging app in Japan, Thailand, Taiwan, um, Chile. They have a number two position in India, Indonesia, and Brazil. And today, that business is already earning them $100 million per quarter. And if you think that's in the space of two years that this business has been created. 
So that's sort of a, a pretty interesting one that we have in the portfolio at the moment. Another one is Zillow. Now Zillow's actually made the papers here in the last couple of days. Some local individuals bought a bit of stock in it. Um, we've been there for a while. Um, we're up probably, it's a bit, not quite 50% since we first bought it. But very quickly, Zillow, if you like, is the realestate.com of the US. Uh, but the real estate portals in the US, for, it's a long story, but are far less developed than they are here. Uh, and today, you can buy Zillow for $3.8 billion. It's the market cap. Um, compare it to realestate.com, it's around $3.9 billion. And, you know, I guess very simply, the US property market's just a little bit bigger than ours. So, another interesting one. Um, but there's a whole range of areas, and a lot of these businesses we've been talking about are sort of, I guess, those classic virtual companies in some respects, but there are many real businesses very, uh, with, with deep technology that have very solid positions that will um, benefit from the changes that are occurring. So Ericsson, um, really one of two companies that can provide 4G infrastructure for the mobile phone companies. Sienna is one of a couple of companies globally that can provide the optical networking and transport equipment uh, for the development of fixed line systems. Uh, in hardware and components, uh, Samsung, you know, yes, it's a mobile phone company. It's, it's the leader in, in smartphones and tablets. Um, it also has a whole lot of the underlying componentry critical for these, uh, these um, for phones and so on. But if you go back a few years ago, Samsung was a memory company. It made the memory chips for your PC, um, both DRAM and flash memory. We think are biz uh, markets where we have a very tight supply-demand scenario occurring as a result of the proliferation of these devices. M together with Micron and Hynix, this industry has consolidated, and we think these three companies from their memory businesses will be entering a, a very profitable period for, for a while now. Um, an interesting one, uh, sort of quite different, is FedEx, who have developed a, over the last decade, a business de delivering parcels to the consumer, so are a clear beneficiary of the whole e-commerce trend. Um, and then we also uh, have, you know, a whole raft of others, some of them we've to you, spoken to you about before. Yuku is a, a video streaming site in China, 51 Jobs is the Seek. Um, sort of a combination between Seek and LinkedIn in China. And then some more boring names, Cisco and poor old Microsoft. These both companies that are significant beneficiaries uh, of what's going on in the internet today. But and in, in aggregate, these stocks are accounting for around a quarter of the portfolio today, uh, the international portfolio. Moving on to other areas though, because we're not just investing in tech. We have a, a range of other themes that we think are quite interesting. And one of these that's been present in the portfolio for a little while has been, uh, I guess, around the repair of the financial systems post uh, the GFC. Uh, we've already made good money out of owning Bank of America, um, uh, Lloyds in the UK, Bangkok Bank in Thailand. The latest one to be added to the portfolio is in Tessa. It's the leading bank in Italy. Uh, it has around 20% of the deposit market there. And not surprisingly, um, it's, it's struggling a little at the moment in an economy that is weak, that's dominated by its small and medium enterprises. There has been a big pickup in bad debts for Intesa and, and the banking system in general. Um, but there's some things about Italy that stand out that make it not quite as desperate as perhaps other parts of Europe. Uh, there wasn't a huge property boom as there was in Spain or Ireland. Uh, there is, um, and also uh, the, the level of indebtedness generally around households and, and corporates is nowhere near what it is in other parts of Europe either. So it's not quite as bad a story and yet the market's quite fearful because of the general prospects for that economy. Um, and on top of that we have an issue where the ECB you know, last year was lending money to the European banking systems to hold them up, the so-called LTRO loans. These loans need to be paid back um, in 2015. 
that won't be a problem for Intesa, uh, but for other parts of the banking system, that's going to cause a challenge. So together with this difficult you know, economic environment, the concerns over how uh, the banking systems come out the other side of these LTR loans, means that there's a fair bit of concern about the prospects for this bank. However, it is trading at 60% of book value, and we think this represents very good value for a banking franchise of the quality of Intesa. And if we think about the investments we made in Lloyds and Bank of America, we made them at similar valuations level to this, to this, and subsequently we've more than doubled our money in those, those banks. So we, uh, we still remain quite enthusiastic about the, the, the opportunities in the financial sector. The rejuvenation of Japan is another uh, story within the portfolio as well, and I, you know, I've already mentioned much of what drives our enthusiasm for Japan in a, in a big picture sense. But one of the concerns, obviously, is the market's already run up quite hard over the last year. But if we look at the profitability of Japan and simply just look at what the devaluation of the yen means, we, it's our view that to a large extent that run up simply reflects the improved profitability coming from a weaker yen. So if we look at Toyota, um, it's one of the key holdings in the portfolio. If you look at this chart, what you'll see is over the last couple of years, the company has gone from essentially a break-even level to record profitability. And in the last year, a huge amount of that has been driven by that devaluation of the yen. So then if we then look at the stock price and what that's done, it's doubled over the last year, more than that from the very bottom. But it's doubled, and yet it remains on this year's earnings on only 11 times. So we think there's plenty of opportunity still in Japan. We have around 15% of the portfolio there and remain completely hedged out of the yen. The emerging market consumer has been another story in the portfolio for a while now, represented by stocks such as uh, Perno, who have uh, who've developed great positions selling their products into places like China and India. Um, but the emerging markets in general have not been the place to be the last two or three years, and as a result, um, there have been opportunities to add to stocks in this area. Now, as I was talking about China before, we really want to stay away, we think, from the investment-led parts of the emerging world, but we don't actually think that any slowdown we're getting here is a really significant uh, issue for the consumer. Um, and so we still like those areas. So we've got one of the, the stocks we've added uh, in recent times, uh, you know, starting about a year ago, is Casino. It's actually a French retailer. Um, but their investments in the emerging world have led them to significant positions in Brazil, Thailand and Colombia. And these businesses now account for well over half of the company's earnings. So in aggregate, the business is growing at around 10% per annum. We're buying it on around 14 times today after it's, it's run up a bit from where we've bought it. But we think this represents a, a, a terrific investment um, and, uh, and, and should give us some pretty good returns. Very quickly, just going through a few of the other uh, and sort of recap on other uh, stories we've talked about in the past. Pharmaceuticals, the global pharmaceutical companies, have, as you recall, faced you know, major challenges in the last few years with the roll-off of their uh, patents and facing generic price competition. Um, these companies have been much more flexible than anyone would have believed in terms of cutting their costs and thus maintaining profitability while they wait around for their, their new drugs to come through the pipeline. We've made good money here. We've sold positions like Johnson & Johnson, Sanofi. We've cut our positions back significantly. But still, these uh, stocks in aggregate um, account for around 7% of the portfolio. A year ago, we were talking to you about uh, the US capital spending story. And if you recall, this was about the, the lower energy prices that have come as a result of the unconventional energy resources that have been developed in the US, particularly gas, um, and we expect this to drive a whole range of investment in and around the energy uh, industry. And we own companies such as Jacobs Engineering, which has done very well over the last year, um, but also Foster Wheeler and uh, KBR. They're, they've sort of not been great performers yet, but we think that this is, can, will continue to be a long-term story 
of ongoing growth. Uh, the other one we focused on a year ago, solar energy. Um, hasn't been such a great story throughout the last 12 months. Um, if you recall what that was about, it was about the, the you know, solar panels now becoming competitive with the grid um, in more and more locations and thus driving investment in solar. Uh, subsequently, we went through a period of um, sort of tariffs being put on uh, the Chinese panel makers by the US and Europe, um, or parts of Europe. But we're now coming out of that. Uh, these stocks have actually staged a great recovery in recent weeks. Um, it's a small part of the portfolio, only around a percent, but we think these stocks will make us uh, good money in the years to come. So in summary, where we see the opportunities for investors is in the individual stocks, in the industries. And we think all of these companies that we've been talking to you about today, we think they're going to prosper irrespective of what the broader global environment may be. And given the prices that we're paying for these stocks, that is what makes us optimistic about potential returns. Now, I appreciate the message that we have about investing is not particularly an easy one for the individual investor to take on. I mean, who really wants, um, and that just reminds me, I've missed my most exciting story in the whole thing, so I actually have to backtrack, I'm sorry. Um, after all the technology stocks, I've got to go back to Intel. How could I forget it? Um, Intel. So this company has been the monopoly um, uh, manufacturer of processors for your PCs and servers uh, for a long time. And the, the struggle that they've had in recent years with the move to mobility is that it has triggered a, uh, a, a big setback in the PC market. Um, now, the reason for this is that they didn't have their chips in, the, in your smartphones or tablets. These were using uh, a company, uh, technology from a company called Arm. And the reason for that was simply around the uh, power consumption of, uh, of, of their chips. Now, if you look at the design of microprocessors, um, we have a very simple trade-off here. The faster the processor's speed, the greater its power consumption. And because of Intel's background and wanting to make more and more powerful PCs and servers, their focus was always on making those faster chips. So the issue for them when the mobile market came was that they didn't have chips that uh, operated at that low power consumption, thus gave you good battery life, and they missed out on that market. But the thing about... Um, the positioning of Intel is that all isn't equal in this world, and this company has a very significant advantage um, in its, uh, its process technology. And what I'm referring to here is when they make their microprocessors, the line width on the circuitry, uh, currently they're, they're making chips with a, a line width of around 22 nanometers. Uh, in the middle of 2014, that will come down to 14 nanometers. So, at 14 nanometers, you were talking about 28 uh, atoms is the width of that line. Now, what that does is that the lot finer the line width, um, the, the better your power consumption for the same processor speed. So, Intel having missed the mobile market, and you remember the first iPhone only really came out in 2007, uh, have been busily designing a, a new range of microprocessors designed specifically for that market. And next year, in the middle of next year, we'll bring these out on their leading edge process. And they are a good two years ahead of the competition. So they will come into the market next year with a range of chips that for a given processor speed will be significantly uh, less power hungry than what's in the marketplace. So in simple terms, they will be able to produce a chip at the processor speed of their competition that will give you a battery life of somewhere between three to six times greater uh, than what's currently available. And we think as a result of this, Intel will mount a significant fight back uh, into the smartphone and tablet market. Uh, and indeed, 
we would think that they would regain, you know, regain their rightful share over a period of a few years. Now, this company, um, you know, it is one of the great industrial companies of our time, extraordinarily deep technology, very profitable. Um, but today, the market, because of its loss in the, um, in the mobile market, is trading at a, treating it as if it's some third-rate industrial that's gone ex-growth. You can buy this stock today on 12 times earnings. So to get back to where I was before, um, you know, the message about our, our message about investing is not really the most palatable one for the individual. I mean, who does want to buy Intel when PC sales are down 20%? Who wants to buy an Italian bank when that country is mired in recession? Generally, that's not a message that resonates with many. It's a difficult message, but we think it's an important one, and simply for this reason, investing this way works. If we look at the International Fund uh, over the last 18 years, $10,000 invested in the International Fund would be worth over $94,000 today, a return, a compound return of 13% per annum. The same investment in the market would have given you around $24,000, $26,000, or 5.3% compound. But if you want a, a really extreme example of our investment process working, I'd ask you to look at the Japan Fund. Now, in the 16 years of this fund's existence, that market has not given you one cent of return. And yet our fund has made 14.4% compound, or turning, has turned $10,000 into $78,000. Investing against the flow of the, the crowd will make you money. Now, finally, I'd just like to talk about uh, uh, the, the changes that Platinum have made, specifically my elevation to Chief Investment Officer, and in particular what that implies uh, for CARE's, uh, CARE Nielsen's day-to-day -day involvement at Platinum. Now, just to give you a little bit of background on the change, you know, at Platinum, um, the, the, within the investment team, it's always been a fairly informal environment. Yes, individuals had their responsibilities about what uh, sectors or geographies they covered, but it was just everyone's job to get on and find money-making opportunities for clients. Now, the team has grown and we now have uh, 29 people in the team, and what we have found the need to do is to introduce a little more structure to, to that team, um, to just ensure uh, a well-coordinated research process and to maintain a high level of communication within the group. And what we've done over the last couple of years is to create small teams um, within the greater team, and that is having a very uh, significant improvement uh, in the productivity of the team in general. Now, in this context, the role of the CIO is really about making sure each of these teams are working well and working together as required. But coming on to the question of CARE's involvement day to day with the business, nothing has changed. CARE's portfolio responsibilities remain as they were. He continues to manage 85% of the Platinum International Fund. And I can assure you that his enthusiasm for investing hasn't changed at all. But that really is the point. Investing is not a job or a career for someone like Care or myself. It is simply something that we do. So I'd like you to think about some of the great investors of our time. John Templeton, still investing at 96 when he passed away. Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett are still going strong at 89 and 83 respectively. And George Soros, probably the greatest moneymaker of all time, still involved in the markets at 83. So on this basis, I'm expecting to get another good 25 to 30 years out of care. Now, I would grant you that probably in 25 years, care won't be running quite as much of the money as he is today. But what you should simply envisage is that gradually over time, greater responsibility will be taken up by other members of the team. And this is not, I think, anything to be of any 
particularly concerned about. If you look at the performance of each of our funds, each independently managed by portfolio, other portfolio managers, what it demonstrates is that within the team, we have at least seven other portfolio managers who have great long-term records. But in fact, that's better than that, because if you think of two of our founders who have now left us, Toby Harrop and Jim Simpson, they also had great long-term records. The point here isn't that Platinum's got lots of great money makers in its team, which it does, but that's not the point. The point is simply this. Our investment approach works, and when it's applied by capable people, you will get good results. Anyway, that's where I'd like to leave it. Thank you very much again for your attention, and I'd just... Um, Happy to take questions on anything. Care if you'd like to come up and uh, join me for Q&A. That'd be great. Thank you. Now, just while we're getting the microphones out uh, to people, there's one, one question that's been coming up a lot when we've been meeting with people, and it's the issue of, um, within our portfolio, the increase in the number of stocks that we currently hold. Now, the background to this is that each of our analysts, after they've been with us two or three years, start to run their own analyst portfolio. It's a small portfolio of stocks, their, their key ideas. And it's been done to ensure that analysts are engaged with markets and the, and the process of making money. And the result is there are more stocks in the portfolio because not all of the stocks they buy are bought by the portfolio managers. But these are small holdings. They're not particularly significant in the context of the overall portfolio. So when we look at uh, the issue of the number of stocks and concentration, we look at the key holdings. And what this chart shows is that the top 50, you know, over the last uh, you know, several years have really ranged between 60 to 70% of the portfolio. Um, there's nothing really changed there. In fact, at the moment, the concentration's at the higher end of that uh, that range. So anyway, I'm just looking for, here we go, down here. See, as you know, we, um, we are out of the Australian dollar and have been slightly short, in fact, and um, just around the time of the budget, we actually uh, took some puts, volatility was very cheap, so we took the advantage of that and made some money out of that. Um, now we're pretty square. We have no uh, yen, and um, the rest is US dollars, euro, and European currencies, and some Asian currencies. On the, um, the shorting, um, we remain short to around 15%. We had some puts in the other day. Again, volatility was very low. We've cashed those out at decent profit. Um, we're not making money, we're losing money on shorts, um, and they principally are the, the uh, Russell and a retail index, uh, uh, ETF, and then some specific stocks in engineering, uh, many of them related to the resource boom. Uh, they may make us some money, but it's what's actually happening is this last big run up we've seen has all been re rating rather than earnings and um, they've just held their value. We, we thought they'd sort of stumble backwards a bit, and they haven't. So we're not sort of uh, genetically uh, grafted to having those shorts, but there is enough uncertainty. We'll see some turbulence in, in Syria. We'll see a few of these things. So we're just, they're in place. And frankly, we think the, the, the excitement in markets is going to move away from the US to more of these other markets, particularly Europe. We've seen a lot of flows into Europe, and we see huge opportunities in places like China. Some interesting developments are taking place in India. So we don't think having the shorts on, which are principally in the US, is the most dangerous thing at the moment. Um, sorry to take you back to the boring macro. Um, and congratulations on the, particularly on the performance of the Japan Fund, which is pretty extraordinary. But with Japan specifically, and given that it is you know, a very large economy, how do you see 
their enormous debt to GDP and their um, terrible demographics? How do you see them coming out anything other than badly for Japan and then possibly for the region? Yeah. When we bought that market, um, you know, it was we had an, the whole market was setting at 90% of book, and this is a working democracy of some description. It is a true capitalist society with some central guidance, um, and has the highest R&D expenditure to GDP in the world. It, it, it's still a very much a technologically driven market. So when you can buy an entire country at less than book, it's interesting. But to answer specifically. We have never accepted this argument about demographics. These are global businesses they run. It's determined by the globe. Um, no one particularly focuses on Germany, which also has a shrinking population, or did have. And not today, because um, half of the southern Europe is going up there. But um, so, so that's not a good argument. The question that we cannot really uh, address with any conviction is the problem of having so much debt. And when we talk about the end of QE or tapering, we must remember this is the one country that is still in QE with, uh, with uh, you know, squared. I mean, they really are creating a lot of money. So we see inflation as being the outcome, and we see the yen remaining, remaining weak, and they'll do perhaps what we've seen in many other countries, is simply inflate their way out. and. Um, suppress interest rates, punish those who own fixed interest and induce them to own risk assets. We, we think the bull market in Japan will be pretty substantial. It's been big, but we think it'll be substantial. Thank you for the presentation. Um, can you comment on the valuation in the portfolio at the moment? Um, before uh, your recent success, there were some people questioning the position maintaining with Platinum, and when you looked at it, I think from memory the PE was around seven or eight in the entire portfolio. So, uh, has it moved much from there? I mean, I, I, it would be. I don't know if it was ever quite that low, um, but but certainly, you know, in general. Uh, it would be um, probably more of the order of 12 or 13, I think, if you take out the loss makers. Um, or but higher. It, sorry? Or higher, right? Could be a bit higher. But, but it really is, I think, this, the strength of some of those businesses, the sort of Ericsson's and the, um, you know, the Intel's that are in there and the growth prospects, I think, you know, you've got to look at it in the context of, of that. So, I mean, I think... Um, one of, the, one of the interesting things that's talked about a lot at the moment, and it's the complete reverse of pre-2008, is that there's a huge amount of um, stuff being written up about valuations and long-term valuations and um, how, how high they are. And, you know, we're at the moment, we're using these very long-term measures, using, you know, 10-year average earnings to work out valuations and, and deciding that P's are high, uh, having been through a period of decent earnings growth. Um, and so I'm faced again every day with all these, you know, messages, stocks are expensive, stocks are expensive, and my response to that is, what about mine? Mine aren't, and I don't think they are. And I can tell you the exact opposite experience pre-2008. All we ever heard about was the Fed model and how cheap stocks were, and that, you know, you had to buy stocks because look at the difference between, you know, interest rates and earnings yields. And back then, you know, it was like, well, that's great, but tell me which stocks these are that are cheap. I could never find them. So I, I think <laughs> it comes down to the, you know, at, that those aggregates can, you know, you should look at them, but I don't think they always actually give you the, yeah. the answer. We're, we're vague on it because it doesn't, it doesn't really help us much. So when we first bought um, Toyota a year ago, we were buying it at 29 to 3,000 yen. Its total earnings were around seven or eight um, billion dollars. This current year, they'll earn close to 22 billion, we think. Next year, 26. So the historic doesn't give us a good idea, particularly you know, when you're particularly when you're buying depressed stories. And then when you start buying internet type of stocks, it really gets horrible because I mean you're buying them on eight times current sales. 
But that doesn't mean they're expensive. And you might say, gee, you guys are wandering off to the ferry somewhere. But that's not the case. We're actually seeing these global businesses. And, and what we, we love to broadcast is this whole idea that mobility completely changes the world. And we had that sort of hiccup about uh, six to 12 months ago where everyone was getting a bit concerned about um, the changeover to, mo to mobile devices for advertising and so on. But what the, the rea reality is, we all now have a, a internet address as we carry around a smartphone. Each and every one of us with a smartphone has an internet address. That's a huge transformation for humanity. And when you think that these businesses can address, as we indicated with Naver, from, from nowhere to 250 million people in, within two years, you, you've got an extraordinary opportunity developing here. So that's our problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ken and, and Andrew, um, and congratulations on your great performances on behalf of our investors and ourselves. So thanks, well done. Um, part of your art performance has been attributed, I would say, simply to three factors. One being the weakening Aussie, the other being the general uplift in the world markets, but also, very importantly, your superior stock picking performance. Going forward, um, Karen Andrew, what are your views on the Aussie versus the basket of currency for the year ahead, please? Thanks. I, I think that, um, you know, longer term, we would expect the Aussie to continue to weaken. Um, I think, you know, we're just past that peak in our terms of trade uh, and, and interest rates here generally are going lower. And I think that um, both those would argue, you know, that the trend continues to be lower. But in the year ahead, it's a little harder because I think that, you know, if anything, if I was thinking about the next six months, I'd say there's a reasonable chance that we get a run up in the Aussie. Um, you know, a lot of the anecdotal observations coming out of China is that, you know, the activity's picking up. Um, things like stockpiles of iron ore are falling there. The iron ore price has been re amazingly resilient and, um, you know, it's not that surprising given the high marginal cost of produce production that, uh, you know, comes out of a place like China. So I suspect that, um, you know, as a best guess in the next six months, you know, we, we're probably facing the Aussie rallying. But we, you know, we don't like to really take positions against what is our longer term view, which is that it is weakening. So, you know, we're not likely to take on a lot of Aussie dollars into the portfolio to try and protect investors from that. But in alternatively, would be more looking to maybe take another short position on the Aussie dollar if that actually does occur. Um, I was just wondering what your thoughts were. There's quite a lot of noise at the moment regarding emerging markets. You touched upon India, and we've obviously seen significant moves in currencies there. Um, how do you see that unfolding in the next six, 12 months? Yeah. So India, India is an interesting one because um, well, for, for all, it's, it's quite amusing, actually, some of the commentary around uh, the emerging markets. Because what we've seen is you know, foreign investors, particularly US investors, who have piled into the emerging bond markets now head for the doors with the fear of uh, tapering. And that's had an impact on the currency markets. But you know, you then start fitting the mu you know, the words start to fit the music. So the stock market's selling off, the currencies are selling off, and so now we have a current account crisis in these countries, most of who are running current account surpluses and have for some time. Even in Indonesia is in its, entering its second year of having a current account deficit after a decade of surpluses. So I think I think a lot of that stuff is storm in a teacup stuff. When we look at India, it's a bit different. You know, there is a perennial issue there with its fiscal deficit and its current account deficit. But when you actually start looking at hard at the numbers, you know, half of the current account deficit is gold imports, or sorry, 2% out of the 5% is gold imports. And that's been going on for a long time. So you actually look at household holdings of gold in, the, in India, and it's 55% of GDP. Um, on top of that, if you look at total debt in that country, it's only up in the, I think it's around 90% of GDP. So really India does have a problem, but it's not on the current account. It is really around um, persistent inflation, which runs at around 10%, and the high interest rates 
that that has brought. And, you know, that is crunching activity in a fairly typical, you know, interest rate cycle. But we has, as of this week, a new Governor of the Reserve Bank of India, and if we're to read, you know, his opening speech as meaningful of anything, I think we have a very different environment coming uh, for the financial sector in India in particular. Some of the reforms are perhaps longer term, but, but ultimately, if nothing else, what it highlights is that India has essentially, a, you know, only partially open capital account. So it's not that much of a, it's not that, ob you know, when you have a bit of a current account deficit, it is harder to fund it. But, you know, there's clear opportunities for that country to reform uh, their financial sector. We get an election next year. I, I just see that what, what we're seeing in the Indian market is stocks that are sensitive to high interest rates are being sold off very aggressively. And I just think they're, it's, a, it's a good buying opportunity in those. And that's what we've been, been doing. And for all the hype, you know, these countries are still growing at, uh, India is still growing at, at its worst spot now, 4%. China's growing at supposedly about 6 or 7 I mean, these countries are still growing quite nicely. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, you've given us an insight into your processes and the, the informal gatherings, etc. when you um, nut, the, nut the portfolio out. What's, uh, when you look at, I suppose, Syria at the moment and, you know, different wars and things that are going on and the, the noise, how does that play into that process when the, you know, the fear and the gyration of markets and how, how, how does it play into your process when you're thinking through? Well, it's, by and large, um, it's very hard for us to either predict those events or to actually have any great insight into how they'll unfold. And so I think that, that that's, you know, where I sort of, you get back to that long-term approach of saying, well, you know, do I want to sell some of my intel today because I'm worried about, you know, that the US are going to go into Syria and what that might do to oil prices and, and markets in general. So, you know, as a, a, a typical, uh, you know, and I think also, you know, that the more lowly price stocks are, the more resilient they are to those sort of events. So, you know, I, I guess the answer is we, we can't do a great deal about it, and, and nor do we, but, um, Kieran, I don't know how you'd like to... Yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting question. I think that the... We tend to res resort to looking at things like liquidity, direction of corporate profits, um, liquidity being the principal driver. And the thing that's sort of been putting us off stocks in some areas is just the very high level of corporate profits in relation to their history. And it's been hugely driven by the substitute of cheap labour in the emerging countries. Now that's not going away and we don't really have in the developed countries any evidence of inflation. So we think liquidity remains in place for some while here and uh, in a general sense, the inflation we're seeing in the money stock will, will be reflected in real assets. But the very specifics you're asking, we tend to ignore uh, the sort of political um, exasperations of the day because they, they just come and go. And it doesn't really help us. Liquidity is the in interesting driver and, uh, and where corporate profits are in relation to their history. Platinum has uh, two stocks listed on the local market, PTM and PMC. How would you advise an investor wanting to benefit from Platinum's expertise and management philosophy? How would you advise them about investing either in the shares and the difference between the two or in your managed funds? Right. Well, with Platinum Capital, you know, it, it is a direct substitute, I guess, for the Platinum International Fund, so it has a very, obviously, the same investment approach um, and, and a very similar uh, portfolio. Uh, it can trade at a premium or discount to book value, so that's the other variable to consider. And it obviously, uh, if things are going well, it's delivering up a franked dividend rather than uh, uh, a distribution that is not yet taxed. So I think, really, I think the big difference there is whether it's at a premium or a discount, but people have different views about whether they want those frank dividends or not. Um, but they're really op you know, options, you know, alternatives. Um, you know, PTM, Platinum Asset Management, at the, the management company, well, you know, I just see that it's, it's very different. 
Um, you know, it's clearly about how well we're, we're travelling as a business and, um, and has a, a, a much greater uh, set of variables that, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't see it as a, as a substitute in any way for, for investing in the funds. You ducked that nicely. <laughs> Well, thank you all very much for coming this morning. If there are any other questions you have to ask, we'll be, we'll be staying behind. It's very good of you to come. Please do fill out those forms so we can improve the, the content and the time and all the other uh, questions we ask. Nice to see you all. Thanks for coming. Thank you.